Hi everyone, my name is Charlie and today I have my August wrap-up. August was a strange month for me. I feel like the start of August happened that long ago because I can't really remember much about the books that I read at the start of the month. This could be because I've read more books that have impacted me somewhat. It may be because a lot has happened in August in relation to other things that reading almost took a backseat in terms of my general thoughts and opinions. I don't understand it, but when I looked and saw that I'd only read these books last month, I was somewhat surprised. The first book that I read in August was The Doll Factory by Elizabeth McNeil. This follows the character of Iris in London 1850. I believe this is Victorian London. I think that the author was definitely inspired by Dickens in some ways with some of her characters. I purchased this book because of Simon over at Savage Reads. He recorded a review of this book and he also did a chat with the author. The Doll Factory has a character named Silas and I believe that he's the first character we're introduced to and he is involved in the world of taxidermy and this book discusses art in the Victorian era and it seems to be in some sort of transitional stage. Silas is looked down upon because of the art that he's making. Iris is a woman and because of that I feel as though her art is still looked down upon. She's not seen as being an artist. She leaves her job to become the model of this painter and it's seen as a lowly job. She is equated to being almost a prostitute or something that was denigrated during this time. I actually ended up not enjoying this book as much as I thought I would. I know that I don't give star ratings anymore and that this book is a very clear reason as to why because I felt that the ending of this book was stretched out to fill up the word count, but then we reached the end point of the novel. There'd been a climax that I hadn't expected. I hadn't expected the writer to go there, and I was particularly thrilled by that. I have enjoyed the process of reading this book because I think that Elizabeth McNeil captures the tension and the weird, absurd thoughts and characters of the time, and it's this dark, twisted story really, and that aspect I really enjoyed. However, I feel as though the characters weren't necessarily particularly strong. I felt at some points they could be a bit caricature-ish, and Yet, in terms of story, I felt as though everything that happened in this book would happen and nothing was left to fall to coincidence or some heroics. I enjoyed the aspect. I enjoyed the ending because the ending was not the ending that I'd expected. But then at the same point, I didn't know whether I ought to feel cheated by that because I'd expected one thing and that thing wasn't what I thought had been promised. I think that this is one of those almost gothic reads that would be a great book to read as we go into autumn and winter. I think that you might appreciate it more during that time. I think that the writer is a grand writer and I look forward to what she puts out in future. But I'm pleased to say that I don't think this is her best work, but I look forward to seeing what that could be in the future. Next I'm going to mention the Forward Book of Poetry 2017 and the Forward Book of Poetry 2018 because I have unhauled these books already. I, I don't feel anything for the poems in there. I feel as though I don't get them. I know that there were a few standouts in there but there was nothing that really made me stop and think and consider and I found that usually the collections start off great because they will have poems that have been taken from other poets collections and they're the best poems from those collections and yet when it comes down to it when it comes to the individual poems that are in here there are just some cases where I don't understand why they're being seen as best poems 
And there's a poet that I particularly like who had a poem in here and I was really looking forward to it and I felt like it went on too long and I felt as though it was only in here to increase the shock value and it just needed better editing and I don't know whether poets reach this point of becoming more grandiose and grandiloquent as they move on in their careers and figure they can talk about anything but it just there's nothing in either of these two collections that will make me go back. There were no poems or poets that I'd want to seek out again. They're gone and I don't think I'll be looking at the forward collections again. However, I may recommend them to new readers of poetry because I do believe that if you want to get into poems or you're a writer of poetry, then these are good markers for what editors are looking for, really. Next, I read A Wonderful Stroke of Luck by Anne Beattie. I don't have that to show you because I unhauled it immediately after reading. This book follows a character whose name I can't even remember at the moment, but basically he is at college in America. He's having all these... F no, he's not at college. He's not at college. He's at high school in America having philosophical discussions that were so out there that I believed the character was older than he was and believed he was attending college, but he wasn't. He was at high school. I believe it was some sort of private school, but I cannot be sure of that. I am a bit of a dick when it comes to stories related to really rich people leading fantastic lives who are a bit upset. I just don't like that sort of thing. And that's what I got here. At the 50 page mark, Anne Beattie happened to include 9-11 and I don't know why it had been included apart from being used as some sort of inciting event. I felt as though this story was just completely one note throughout. I think that the author just had this long list of things that this character would do. You would be told stuff that had happened during the periods and of years that happened between chapters. Um, it glossed over really heavy subjects and people who've read this said that this is all what proves Anne Beattie is a good writer because her readers have to read between the lines of things that have happened. However, I don't think that that was the case here. I think that Anne Beattie is a fine writer, but I think that there is nothing more behind her stating events that have happened. It read like a long list of things that had happened to this character. It read as though the author didn't particularly know the behaviours of the characters she wrote about and honestly it just felt like this long diatribe of reasons to hate young people in America and I don't care for it and this is the second novel of Ambities I've read that I haven't enjoyed and I feel like she writes novels in the same way she observes the short story but I prefer the short stories of hers I've read. I'd say that she's much better at her craft when she's working on shorter fictions than working on these longer narrative pieces because there's just no structure to, to them. It is just a case of throwing events at the reader and hoping for them to create some sort of story, jigsaw it together. Um, so that book is gone. Next, I read The Mysterious Affair at Styles by Agatha Christie. This is Poirot's first case. I like Agatha Christie's writing, but because I have seen this so much already, I knew the ins and outs of the story, which was to its detriment, really, because all I was doing then was just reading the book to see how Agatha Christie would bring us to the solution of the crime since I already knew it. The thing is, I really enjoy Agatha Christie's writing, so I enjoyed this one. I don't think it's her best work, but then I don't care for the Poirot stories as much as I care about the Miss Marple stories. Next, I have a book that I was sent for free by the publisher Joanna Cannon's Breaking and Mending. This is the first book in what the Welcome Collection is calling the Lifelines series. I thoroughly adore this book. After reading This Is Going To Hurt by Adam Kay, I'd been looking for more books like this, 
There is one by a nurse that I lent to a volunteer and I'm waiting for her to return so that I can then read that one. Um, but I can't remember the title right now. But with the state of the NHS at the moment and the way that people are talking about the NHS, I've always been a bit critical of the new government ever since they put a man who literally wrote a book about dismantling the NHS in charge of it. I think that the NHS is a great thing and since reading This Is Going To Hurt I felt a bit more sympathetic towards the junior doctors and reading Joanna Cannon's story, which I didn't know about before, just emphasised how much sympathy I have for the sorts of people that put themselves into this situation where they simply want to help others. This is a look. Uh, it's Joanna Cannon's life. Uh, it's not necessarily being the typical junior doctor, the typical student. She was a bit older than her peers. One part of this book, she's even asked the question how she feels about um, being managed by someone younger than her. It also discusses why she chose to go into psychology. It's written in a way that isn't the writer saying this is how you ought to feel. It's again like all good works of non-fiction is presenting you with the story and you can take what you will from it. I really think that Joanna Cannon is a masterful writer. I adored this book and I think that you should all go out and purchase a copy. It's written incredibly well, it is deft, it is precise, You, there is humanity and heart behind this story and I can't wait to get my hands on a finished copy. Next I read Reservoir 13 by John McGregor and I still don't know how to feel about this book. This book begins with people in this town searching for a missing girl. Each chapter goes through a year in the life of this town, going from villager to villager, and just presents this series of things that are happening. And I realised after the Ambiti book and this book, I don't necessarily like that kind of book. I like a book that has plot. The reason that I went into this book was because I thought, and again, I'm not disappointed because what I thought was this book was going to be about, it wasn't. I'm disappointed by the way this book was executed. The way this book was presented to me is that it would be telling the stories of all these different people, but the missing girl was going to be at the heart of it, and that maybe we'd get some resolution in this story. But there is no resolution at all. Again, it's just this list of things that happen to characters and then the book ends and it goes over, what, 10, 13 years? I can't remember how many will it be. Yeah, so it lasts for about 13 years and you see the ins and outs of these characters' relationships, how the shadow of this missing girl perhaps influenced the lives of these people in this town and I understand why some people might adore that and this might be the book for them and that is great but it's not a book for me. I need to feel something for characters and I need plot. I apparently am the reader of the reading group fiction and it's all thanks to Katie over at Books and Things for her most recent video. I will leave a link in the description where she actually finally gave me some clarification over what literary fiction and reading group fiction was and I realised I'm here for the reading group fiction. I'm not here for the literary fiction because I need plot, I need characters, I need to feel something for these characters. I felt nothing for the people in this book and I kept going through it hoping beyond hope that I was finally going to get some bloody answers and did I get any answers at all? No. Did I care about anyone at all? No. In fact, well, yeah, basically this book ended up being a bit like Lanny by Max Porter, except I ended up always comparing the two. They're entirely separate, different books written in completely different styles. And yet I was comparing them because I was getting this story of villages and I like stories about these towns, about these villages. I like when you're getting stories about that, but I need to feel something and I felt nothing. I felt incredibly detached the entire time. 
I do not like this book. I started this by saying I don't know how I feel about this book, but as soon as I started talking about it, I realised I actually do not care for this book. And this is the second time it happened. Eight years ago, when I was at university, oh, it's got to be longer than, no, it was eight years ago when I was at university, Even the Dogs was released. I be, I can't remember which book of the, his that was, but we were asked to read it for uni, so I read it. Did I feel anything at the time? Mm. I felt it was experimental, and at the time I really liked experimental fiction, but then I've since found better works, and I don't like detachment, and I, I get it. I get why people call him this good writer and everything, but I don't like it. In fact, someone accidentally spilled red wine all over my copy of Even the Dogs and offered to buy me a new one. And at the time I said no. And even though I hate damaged books and I accepted it back, I wish I just said, just keep it because I don't like it. I don't care for it. I don't understand it. But I've since read more adult fiction that does this a lot better. And at the time I was like, well, I'm reading young adult literature. Maybe I just don't understand what he's doing. But now I do. I now understand it and I'm not here for it. So sorry about it, but I'm not. Next, I read Poems to Live Your Life by, which was illustrated and um, chosen by Chris Riddell, or Riddle, I don't know. Charlie Brooke was so kind as to send me this after I sent her um, a copy of Frenchman's Creek by Daphne du Maurier and Indisputably Doris, my own book. And she re saw that I was having a bit of a bad time with it this month, um, you know, with all of the stuff going on in terms of my car and my dog. And I have to admit, I was a bit sad at that time. And so she sent me this book. I was glad to receive it. It made me smile. This book goes through every single facet of your life. I'm not quite sure who this book was marketed towards because there are a few classic poems in here. You know, the sonnets by Shakespeare. And I worried that it was going to be this list of people that Chris Riddell had to read at school, so now he was foisting upon the youth. And then the more I've thought about it, the more I've thought that maybe it's actually a good thing that Chris Riddell's primary audience are children, because they're going to see this book, and they're going to get to read some of the older poems that have been illustrated in this form, and when they reach the point that they have to study them later on in their school careers, they're going to think, oh, I know about that poem because of this book. And they're going to have some, hopefully, better memories of it before they have to tear that story, that poem, apart. I will admit that I cared more for the contemporary poems in here, such as the ones by Seamus Heaney, Carol Ann Duffy and Neil Gaiman. Um, but I liked that this book didn't just stick to the poems of the past and stick to the darker stuff, that it went for some of the more funny imaginary stuff as well. I think that it's a great poetry collection to give to anybody really because it's really nicely presented and if you've got a poetry lover in your life then do share it with them because it's just a... oh <laughs> here's my favourite poem out of here, Digging by Seamus Heaney. Um, but there you go, it's just really nicely illustrated and I'm really grateful to Charlie for sending me this because it really did bring a smile to my face in an otherwise sad time. Next, I read The Thirteenth Tale by Diane Setterfield. This book follows the character of Margaret Lee, who works at her father's bookshop. She just spends her days reading. She sometimes writes books about old scholarly writers, and she is contacted by Vida Winter, a person whose books she's never read because she is a modern writer, and Margaret chooses to read the more classic works because she believes they're always going to have an ending and a grand plot. I was introduced to this book by Katie over at Books and Things. She did a read-along of this book last year. I've seen it for years and I never knew what it was about. I, From the cover I thought it was going to be some fuddy, duddy, very musty old type of read that would drag me down. Admittedly I have read the first few pages a lot in the past and I was at work one Friday we had no customers in the shop and I walk I, I'd previously only just unhauled my copy of this book and I saw it there and I thought well let's try it again and I was hooked and over it was cozy reading night that Friday um no it was cozy reading night on the Saturday wasn't it this year was it Friday or Saturday this year 
Well, either way, cosy reading night happened, and basically I ended up reading this book for the entire three hours. I finished this book on the Sunday, or the, yeah, it was the Sunday I remember. I'm not good with dates, but I just loved it. If you want more thoughts, then do go over to my video where I talk about this book. Its links to classical literature were brilliant. Its characters were grand. It's the way it was written of these different stories all interconnecting. There's a lot of misdirection going on. It was like a blend of classic mystery novels and gothic novels and lord it was everything that I like to see in fiction and I had no idea. I have got Once Upon a River to read in September. I will be joining the Bellman and Black read, -a read along that Katie is hosting in the middle of this month and I am just at points I'm sad that I didn't read this sooner but I'm also glad that I read it when I did because I feel as though I've been able to see more of a connection to the classic all works of literature that Diane Setterfield was talking about. But yes, if you have this book, if you've been interested in this book, please read it because it's utterly brilliant and by far one of my favourite books of the year. Next I read my own book which is R Doris by Charles Heathcote, i.e. me, um, but please call me Charlie, please. I'm just begging you. Our Doris follows the character of Mrs Doris Copeland of Shakespeare Avenue as she chooses to enter a garden safari despite not being a gardener herself. This is a series of interconnected monologues all told in the northern comedy fashion of Roy Clark and Victoria Wood. It is somewhat reminiscent of Keeping Up Appearances and Talking Heads by Alan Bennett. And I read this because I was editing Doris Ahoy and I really wanted to make sure that the, t the voice was still there. Also, I want to do a retrospective of all my books at some point in future and there is a series of tweets if you want to go to Twitter and read the thread of me rediscovering stuff that I'd forgotten about this book in the four slash five years since I wrote it. But yeah, <laughs> should also say didn't hate it and if you wanted to support an indie author then I'm right here. Next I read The Shining by Stephen King. This book follows the character of Jack, who moves into the Overlook Hotel with his wife and their child, Danny. I am getting Stephen King's works out of the library, and upon reading this, I realised that maybe he's not the horror writer everyone said he was. I think that he's a great writer of some weird, psychological, possibly supernatural stories. I don't find them terrifying or scary like I've been led to believe they are in the past. I also don't think I enjoyed this book as much as I enjoyed Christine and what I liked about this book was the fact that, so there's obviously somewhat possible paranormal ghostly goings on in this hotel they're moving into. I liked that they were kept completely away from the town so you didn't know whether the character was suffering from cabin fever, was he being possessed by ghosts in the hotel. You're aware that Danny, their child, has what you get told is called The Shining, which I think is supposed to be some sort of telepathic telekinesis probably, some sort of spiritual awakening anyway, that gives him some sort of precognitive abilities. I liked it. I think it's definitely thrilling. I don't know how I really feel about this book. This isn't similar to Reservoir 13 where I ended up despising the book as I talked about it because I don't despise it. I think that Stephen King writes extremely well. I get reminded somewhat of Charles Dickens when I read Stephen King because all of his stories seem to like expand to cover whole towns and you get a feel like Stephen King knows the story inside out and I like that. I found myself a tiny bit reminded of a reverse exorcist sort of situation here with Jack being the possessed one here and his wife and child being the ones trying to save him. I like that twist. I like the idea that maybe uh, th the question of whether this was alcoholism again because this time unlike the girl on the train we know that definitely Jack hasn't been drinking. I like the mention of ghosts, 
And also, I found myself being reminded of A Christmas Carol. And I've said to my sister, I don't know whether all these horror stories being set at Christmas is what also distracts me, because as soon as I think Christmas, I think jolly. I think great stuff. And I can't think of anything horrific around Christmas. So immediately, my idea that this is going to be horrific is dampened, because I'm like, ah, it's not too bad, it's Christmas. I enjoyed the book. I think that if you want to read Stephen King, then, you know, read one of his more famous works, because usually you're going to know what happens, and they're famous for a reason. I just feel like it's a darker version of Dickens, really. It's like A Christmas Carol for the New Ages. Then I read Doris Ahoy by me. It's my new book that technically comes out this Tuesday, the 3rd of September. It follows Doris and Harold as they embark upon a round-the-world cruise and sees them coming back to themselves before events that I have planned for the final book. And I was editing it that week, but I'm saying that I read it. If you wish to purchase copies, then, you know, links are in the description. I'd be very happy if you did. And once again, it's my new book, so I don't hate it. Next, I read Nos 4 R2 by Joe Hill. I talked about this a lot in a 40-minute video that I shared last week. But basically, this book follows the character of Vic, and she is a child who discovers that she has an ability to find things. She has this extra ability that means that she can kind of cross over this portal to discover things that are lost. At first, it's just small things like her mother's bracelet, but eventually it moves on to her ending up finding this man who's been kidnapping children for nearly a century called Charlie Manx. There is something a bit vampiric about him, except that he's not stealing blood, he is stealing children's youth. It's like a darker version of Hocus Pocus. And again, I found myself with this book being reminded a lot of classic children's literature. Alice in Wonderland, Peter Pan, The Chronicles of Narnia, with Christmas Land. It was all in here, so I don't know whether that's what brought this to a different level for me. It was definitely darker than all of those, and I found myself being reminded of Stephen King's prose. Of course, Joe Hill is his son, and I feel as though that's going to get mentioned in a lot of people's reviews. They're always going to be comparing the two. I feel as though Joe Hill's more contemporary, and there are a lot more references to more modern things. I enjoyed this book. I would reread it. Go and watch my 40 minute video if you really want to know more in-depth thoughts about it. With that being said, I'm going to say to go and watch that video for A Winter's Promise by Christelle Dabo. As well, this book follows the character of Ophelia, who is living in this world where it's being separated into these different arcs, and she is being married off to someone from a different arc. <sighs> I didn't like it. I'm going to keep it and possibly reread it in future. I'm going to read the sequel and see whether I feel any differently about it. But I just like the concept but didn't like the execution. And I feel like there's 200 pages in the middle that could have been cut out of this book because that final 100 pages was golden. And I would have really appreciated if this entire series had been condensed into one book because I think that it'd be getting a more favourable review then. Oh my lord. Then I read The Wellworth Beauty by Michelle Roberts. And this book begins in 1851. This character of Joseph Benson is being employed by this man Mayhew, who apparently did write something about the poor, and he's being asked to go and interview prostitutes. Then we fast forward 150 years into the future, and Madeline, this university lecturer, has been made redundant and is now moving into the same house where Joseph interviewed his prostitutes. This book had potential, and that potential was not met. This was the first book that I bought this year that I hadn't previously heard about, and I am incredibly disappointed by it. In each chapter, Michelle Roberts will use a phrase that somehow links into the next chapter. This is common in creative writing, and you, you usually use it in scenes, and it's a bit of the early thing to connect them. So, like, one character will say something and it gets repeated, and the reader reads that and thinks, oh, the writer's really thought about that. But honestly, it felt really basic to me and a really 
poor way of going about things. Also, the story wasn't elaborated on, and this is a near 400 page book, and you're told that it's some sort of ghost story, but that ghost story just felt like a really cheap way to link Madeline and Joseph's parts. And then there's this weird climax in which ghosts appear, and um, Joseph and Madeline are both nearly meeting each other, but both come against adversaries, and there's confusion, and it made little sense as to why that had been included, because there was no need for the, the ghost story, and neither of the character stories got properly told in the fashion they could have been told, because there was this weird interweaving of their narratives that didn't need to be there. Honestly, I think that Madeline's entire story could have been cut because nothing really happened there. I understand what the writer was getting at to show how our attitudes towards um, women have changed over the last hundred or so years, and that the things that Joseph's saying and doing to women um, as the protagonist in Victorian London is now frowned upon, and there's a character of Emmanuel in the modern day who is similar to Joseph, um, but he's used as this more adversarial um, mirror of Joseph. And I understood what the writer was doing, but that was the problem. I could see the writer a lot in here really working hard to impress her reader, but I was not impressed because I felt as though everything she was doing was rendered void by the fact that there was no real resolution to anything. I feel as though the story was left lacking in order that the writer could try and make these neat tricks and I just wish there'd been more conversation that was actually valid because major events happen in these characters' lives and I don't think that they need to be discussed about but the way they're just constantly thrown at you. They could have been plots of several other novels rather than just thrown at you as one lines because they're really shocking things to be said and to happen and they're never developed to the point that it just feels like, oh, Michelle Roberts is trying to appear that she's woke but she's not. She's just talking about things, throwing out topics and never discussing them. Like, if you want to discuss them, feel free to do that, but don't just um, introduce them and then just let them linger, because if they're just going to be sat there doing nothing, then really what is the point of them being in your novel? Continue to develop your characters. That is what the writer should have done. She should have developed her characters with the story that she set out to tell, which was about Joseph being this struggling man in... Victorian London taking on this job of interviewing prostitutes even though he knows that that could see him somewhat denigrated by society in order that he could help um, support his family. But that wasn't the story we got in the end because whilst he was a great anti-hero really because he had good motives but committed bad deeds his story never reached a point of resolution and in the end the story felt as though it just abruptly stopped because Michelle Roberts threw in this weird little ghost story that saw these characters possibly meet on the moor in the modern day. It just, it was weak. The entire book was flat and weak and yes there's some interesting prose in here but interesting prose accounts for nothing if the story is so poor. Then I listened to Lords and Ladies by Terry Pratchett on audiobook. This is one of the witches books from the Discworld series and for the first time I actually found myself really pleased and happy to listen to a witch's story. I've always liked the ideas of these stories but they've never met what I had hoped for before. But this story sees the character of Magrat Garlic about to marry someone from the previous witches book and um, then Granny Weatherwax and Nanny Ogre there as well and it's all supposed to be about this wedding but then there is this new witch who might have awakened the lords and ladies who you soon learn are elves. I thought that this looked at the fantasy genre in a brilliant way and was a great twist on that story of some great evil being awoken. I loved the jokes, I loved the humour, I loved the characters and the characterisation and I liked the fact that I had an older main character being the main protagonist in a fantasy story and it was just brilliant and she was an older female which proving that it's not necessarily all about your education, it's about the way, about learning stuff in life and life lessons that can really make a character rather than someone just being educated for the sake of educated. It's about life teaching you skills rather than needing all this university education and this to become who you think you want to be.
it was great, it was fantastic. I will re-listen to this in future and reread it and I'm so glad to have found this. This stands up there with more and guards guards as some of my favourite Terry Pratchett. And then finally I finished the, this book this morning but because I read the majority of it in August I am including it and that is Murder on the Orient Express by Agatha Christie. Again I knew this story, I knew where it was going to go. In reading it I think that it works better on the screen and be, be, just because this reads more like a play to me and the ending felt very much like Poirot was leaving it up to the reader to decide and the reader to be the jury of how these characters should be judged. If you don't know, it's murder on the Orient Express. It says it in the title, a man is murdered on a snowbound train. Basically, it's not a locked room mystery really. Well, it's a locked room mystery. It's also the story where usually people get trapped in some sort of manor house, but on a train instead. Yeah. People love this book and love this story, but I prefer to see the story on screen. I don't care for the most recent adaptation. My favourite still goes to the 1974 version, but I have great nostalgia for this. Again, it's Agatha Christie and I don't think she can do any wrong, um, apart from Nemesis. That, um, a Miss Marple story that stopped me reading her for about three years but we don't talk about that anymore. I think that if you're going to read Agatha Christie you're going to read this book anyway if you're at all interested in her works. You've probably read this already. It's been around since 1934. I won't spoil it for you but yeah. Good book. I don't need to talk about it really. And them's the books. I honestly did not expect to be recording over an hour's worth of footage for my wrap up. This has never happened before. I don't even know what time it is. I didn't expect to be up here that long but I really must go because my sister just got home about 10 minutes ago and I should probably go and say hello to her and I'm in desperate need of a cup of tea. But then's the books. I did have a good reading month in August and I have a TBR set out for September. The coordinated TBR, the Monsterathon TBR and just some books I want to read are going to be shown to you at some point in future. If you have read any of these books and would like to discuss them then please feel free to do so in the comments. I hope you enjoyed this video and until next time that is all.